Don't be afraid to trust God in everything and trust what the Holy Spirit's telling you. A man walks into an eye clinic and he says, I think my vision's blurry and I may need glasses. And the associate says, oh, you need glasses for sure. No question about it. And the man said, how can you know that? You haven't even tested me. He said, because, sir, this is a bank. <laughs> One lady said to the other, wow, you look so much better when you're not wearing your glasses. And the other replied, well, thank you. You look a lot better, too, when I'm not wearing my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have to laugh a little bit, you know. Laughter, the scripture says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And uh, so I just gave you some medicine right there. And that too will tie in with my sermon today, and you'll see why. Our theme for this year has been prepare for more in 2024. Everybody sign that with me, please. Prepare for more. Thank you. Thank you. Prepare ourselves through, recently it's been through revival and not being lukewarm. Jesus addressed the lukewarm church in Revelation, and we don't want to be the lukewarm church. Amen? We want to be the church that's passionate that's alive, that's uh, not mediocre. We want to be all that God has called us to be. So, before I get to the point for the day, let me just review real quickly. I'm going to capsule this as much as I can, but Jesus longs for us to be passionate, not in a commanding, thou better do it, <laughs> thou shalt do it kind of thing, but he longs for us to be passionate in the way that uh, someone who loves another person longs for that person to reciprocate that love in that way. Because Jesus loves you and he loves you passionately and his longing, his deep desires for you to love him that same way. And when we realize how much passion he has for us, and our passion starts to grow for him, then that passion will overflow into passion for people and for his work and for the church and for serving and all of that. Jesus used the word to describe just how passionate he wants us to be. He used that word zealous. And I've talked about that being hot to bubbling over. Now, some of you might think, well, that sounds like anger. No, he's talking about love that's that passionate. It's kind of like when you play that game uh, where you hide something and somebody's trying to find it and you're cold and you get closer to it, you're getting warmer and you're right on top of it and you're hot, hot, you're burning. It's like that. He wants us to not be way over here. He wants us to be right there with him with that passion burning in our heart because of the passion that he has for us. Amen? So, he also tells us in Revelation how to do that. To repent, first of all, which is not just salvation, it's changing our way of thinking. And I've addressed that in previous messages. Go back and look at some of those if you missed it. Uh, some ways that you can help renew your mind. And then he said for us to open the door of his passion towards us. And how passionate is he towards us? Relentless pursuit. That's how I would describe it. Relentless pursuit. Revelation 3.20, he's knocking on the door. He's knocking on the door of not just unsaved people. He's knocking on the door of the church, of believers, knocking on our heart's door, calling out to us. That's how passionate he is to be inside, to sit down at our table in our heart, to fellowship with us on an intimate level, to be so personal, uh, so connected with us that every little part of our life is he's right in the middle of it. 
that we're, we're connected, we're so, so tightly joined that you can't even distinguish between the two. I mean, that's how close he wants to be to us. That's pretty passionate, isn't it? Can you just picture Jesus knocking on that door and crying out your name and saying, please let me in? That's, that's the picture that you need to have of the Savior. That's how much he loves us. And he pointed out in Revelation 3.17 five conditions that um, were part of the lukewarm church. He said, you don't even realize you're lukewarm. You think you're just, everything's good. Everything's roses, but I'm here to tell you, you're lukewarm, and I don't want you to be lukewarm. I want you to be passionate. I, I want you to be useful. I want you to be serving and accomplishing what I've called you to do. And I want you to be successful in your life, in your walk with me. I want you to experience all the joy and the peace and all, that, all the blessings that come along with being my child. But you don't even recognize you, you need anything, lukewarm church. So he pointed out five conditions and, and said, I'm going to help you to see why you're lukewarm. And the first one we looked at was wretched, a heart that's calloused over, that, that we're, we're not allowing him into that most uh, special, sacred, private place in our heart, that he's somewhere out here on the fringe. We, not that we haven't accepted him as Savior, but there are certain parts of ourselves that we're holding back and saying, no, I, I'm not going to let you in here. That, this is my private spot. You, you can come that far, but no further. That was wretched, and we realized that we need to open that door, uh, every door, every door, everything that would separate us from him. We need to allow him into the most intimate place in our heart. And then uh, miserable was another word that he used. And we talked about being miserable by choice. Miserable by choice. And we talked about opening the door of joy. You can go back and catch that sermon if you missed it. And then uh, he used the word poor. And that's where we, uh, as we pointed out last week, that he, we keep him out of our finances. It's like spiritual things are over here, money's over here, and finances and my spending and all that. They're two separate things, and the two shall not connect. <laughs> and, and he said, you're a lukewarm church if you're doing that. We sh he should be right in the middle of our finances, of our spending and everything. He should be right in the middle of that. Today, we're going to talk about the fourth condition. Jesus said to the lukewarm church, you are blind. You are blind. Did he mean that they were unsaved? No. The letter was written to the church. But he said, you're blind. And because you're blind, you're also lukewarm. So what did he mean by that? Well, did he mean that they were spiritually blind in some way? Yes. Yes, he did. Because remember, this church at Laodicea, this lukewarm church, Church L, we call it, this church, these people believed we know everything we need to know. We got it. Eugene, you ever met anybody like that? I, I, know, I know everything I need to know. <laughs> I got, you can't tell me anything because I know, I know everything I need to know. And I'll be glad to tell you what you need to know. This was, this was the attitude, the mindset of Church L. We have arrived we, we got our stuff together. We're wealthy. We're knowledgeable. We're well-trained. We got it all together. Look at our church. It's the nicest one around. Look at it. it everything about it is, is first class. We got it all together. We know everything we need to know. We don't need to know anything else. We, we're there. Yeah, in that sense, they were spiritually blind. Because I can tell you right now, when every time you reach that point in your life, you can know right now, you, could, you don't even have to talk to anybody about it. You, you can just go ahead and put it down. If you feel like that, then you definitely have a problem. There is no way, no how. 
I have yet to meet a believer that I believe has exhausted every resource and every, they're, they're as close to God as a human being can possibly be, and, 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 and they're just walking in the spirit nonstop every minute of every day. I, I have yet to meet one like that. There's always room for us to deepen our relationship with the Father. You have not, we have only scratched the surface of who he is. And when we start to think we got it all down and we got it all together, we know everything. We don't need anybody to tell us anything. We know it all. That's when we get in trouble. But there's more that Jesus pointed out here. And you have to look at this church in particular to realize what it is. But Church L was, <laughs> they had a, a famous, big-time, well-known medical school. That, I bet that got Brianna's attention. They had a famous medical school. It was... Uh, it would be like the equivalent of UNC School of Medicine, maybe. I understand that's the largest medical school in North Carolina, and it's constantly uh, ranked among the top medical schools in the country. Now, so if you can get a mental picture, maybe it was something like that back in that day. And Churchill was quite proud of their medical school. They were proud of it. In fact, there have been coins that have been recovered. Archaeologists have gone in and found some coins that were produced during the time of Laodicea and Church L. And on those coins, they proudly inscribed the names of illustrious physicians from that time who had graduated from this big-time medical college. They were proud of it. They put it on their money so everybody could see the names of these doctors who were well-known and renowned in the world at that time. Here's a picture of one of those coins right here that they recovered. This is from Laodicea in that time period. And the person on this particular coin is thought to be one of the top leaders of the school of medicine. And I'll tell you his name, but I wouldn't be able to pronounce it. But I've got it here. But they think that's who was on there, one of the top leaders of that school of medicine. And notice that on the other side, it has that serpent staff emblem that's connected with medicine to this day and originated back with Moses and the bronze serpent and all that. Their college of medicine was famous for their eye salve. They had an ointment, and some people say it was more of a powder, I don't know, but they had a medicine that this school came up with to treat eye ailments. And they actually had an ingredient in there that would help prevent infection. So it had some effect. They were extremely proud of this. And they were well known for it, and they got rich selling that stuff. Yes, they did. For Jesus to say that these people were blind, can you begin to see how that hit home with them? I mean, he got right down to the nitty-gritty, went straight to the heart. Ooh, you people are blind. You think you got it all together, you got your eye medicine and you got your college of medicine and your famous physicians and, and especially the eyes, you, you can take care of eye problems and all this. He said, but you are blind. He spoke to them personally, didn't he? And he's still speaking to us today personally. And he's saying, lukewarm church, you're blind. This is the only one of the five words that we're going to talk about. We've talked about, this is the fourth one. We've got one more. But this is the only one that talks about physical health. Churchill, as I said, was very self-righteous. They believed they had it all together, and it was mostly due to them. <laughs> their intelligence, their learning, their wealth, and especially their school of medicine. 
They were blind to God's healing provision. I'm going to use this example again. Here's life over here. Sickness, school of medicine, physicians. Here's God over here. Two separate entities. That's how they saw it. There's no connection between these two. Medicine's over here. And what did we decide? Our life should be in him. Right? Amen. Y'all quiet. They were blind to his healing provision. Church L was lukewarm because they didn't see where healing comes from. They were satisfied with their school and their famous doctors. And they needed, yes, and their money, and they needed to recognize the great physician. And they didn't realize that their training, all of that training from that famous medical school needed to come first from the Holy Spirit. They didn't realize they needed to put those boxes together. Even when it comes to healing. And I'm talking about any kind of healing, not just physical. There's all kind of healing that we need sometimes. And he is our healer. That's who he is. Did you know that's his name? We did a study one time on the names of God. Did you know that was one of his names? Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. That's his name. That's not an arbitrary thing. That's who he is. Mm, mighty quiet in here. Why do you think wounds scab over? You get a scratch and it, it scabs over and heals after a period of time. Why does it do that? Just a happen so, a quirk? God designed us that way, didn't he? He, he incorporated it into us. Our body has a tendency to heal. It wants to heal. That's the way he designed it because it's designed by the healer, Jehovah Rapha. Now, listen carefully to what I'm going to say right now. Don't you go out of here and say, Pastor Doug's against doctors and medicine and, and uh, hospitals and all that. He's just against it all. Did I say that? No. I did not say that. We have some of the best medical professionals right here with us today. No, I'm not against hospitals and doctors and medicine and all that stuff. But we need to learn that first and foremost, we need to follow the Holy Spirit on everything. Don't be afraid to trust God in everything and trust what the Holy Spirit's telling you. All right, I'll give you an example. Let's say that you are having uh, some kind of physical medical emergency going on. First and foremost, be in tune with the Holy Spirit. If we were in tune with the Holy Spirit all the time, the Holy Spirit might just tell you, now he could say, dial 911. He could also say, now if you if, do this right now, even if you've called them and they're on their way, go ahead and do this right now. He knows what we need. So I'm telling you the problem is in our mind, somehow we've separated God from from healing, and it's become a man thing, a, a man's accomplishment, man's knowledge, man's education, whatever. But healing comes from God. If healing didn't come from God, you could have all the trained professionals you want, and they still wouldn't be able to do anything. We need to follow the Holy Spirit first. Trust him and follow his leading first. That's all I'm saying. 
I'm not against the medical world. I'm just saying trust the Holy Spirit first because we're supposed to and should and have the privilege of trusting him first in everything. We talked about our finances last week, but in everything in our life, he needs to be first. I need to trust him in my walk every day in everything, every detail. There is no part that's separate over here. There shouldn't be. There is no part of our life that should be separate over here and God's over there. And any area you identify in your life that's like that, you can know, you can rest assured that that's an error because this is where we should be. Our life is in him. In him. First and foremost, trust the Holy Spirit. First, follow his leading. Give God all the credit for healing. Don't be blind as to who provides it. Put your life in his, including your health. And if you do that, you're going to open the door to sight. Sight. See the truth. See the healer. See improved health. Open the door of sight. There's scripture on your tables. I want you to grab those, please. Should be three verses on there. First one is Psalm 103. A couple of verses there. It says, praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who's the healer? Who, whose name is the healer? That's right. That's right. We need to trust him. Amen? First. Psalm 147, verse 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. See, there's all kinds of healing, not just physical. Sometimes we're brokenhearted. The scripture says he's also Jehovah Rapha in those cases. He can heal where nothing else can, where no medication can reach. He can get in there and heal that broken heart, and he will if you trust him to do that. If you recognize him as a healer and trust the Holy Spirit and walk in the Spirit, rest in his love for you. What about Isaiah 40, verse 29? He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Hmm. Where are my people over 60, over 70, over 80? <laughs> He gives strength to the weary. Whoo! The world says you get older, you're going to get tired and you're going to get weak and da-da-da-da-da. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Praise the Lord. He is our healer in many ways. And if he's not, it's because we don't allow him to be. We're, we're still over here with it. You know, that's over there and God's over here. But we want those connected, don't we? And I tell you what, the older I get, that's an encouraging verse right there. <laughs> he gives strength. That means maybe one of these days you'll see Pastor Doug on the platform, 99 years old. And instead of walking in, oh boy, I'm so weak, I can barely make it up here. Maybe I'll just be preaching and jumping and, you know. Woo, I feel good today. Why? Because he's given me strength. I recognize Jehovah Rapha. 
my healer. Oh, boy. It's good to know that he can heal. It doesn't matter what it is. He's my healer. Woo. Make sure your life is in his. Call him by his name. Don't be blinded by man's accomplishments. Medical world is good. Good that it's there. The Holy Spirit can certainly direct you and say, you need to call and you need to go see somebody or whatever. But don't ever be blind and lukewarm and get it in your head that that is the limit right there. Remember that he's the healer first of all. Trust him first. Jehovah Rapha. Because healing comes from him. Open that door of sight. See the truth. See the healer. And see improved health. How many of you could use some improved health? Amen. 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 Well, I just happen to believe that we serve the healer. Yep. Do you believe it today? Church L didn't. They believed in Dr. So-and-so. <laughs> and Dr. So-and-so may be good, but he's not the healer. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, it's God. God is a healer. Now, I like medical professionals who acknowledge that God is a healer. Praise the Lord. I, I have heard of some, met some, and I like it. I, I put a lot more confidence in what they tell me than one that you know, doesn't believe in God over here and thinks that it's all about mankind. We're just people, but we serve the healer. So let's open that door of sight. Never be blind, never be lukewarm, but recognize who our healer is. And thank the Lord our healer has brought some folks back to be with us today, this very day. And our healer has brought Shannon and even gave her strength today to stand up and give testimony of how he's helped her with brokenheartedness. And our healer has brought people like my mother, who's in her 80s now, uh, gave her strength to come in and be part of our worship service this morning. Thank the Lord that our healer is working in so many ways, and he'll just keep doing that the more we trust in him and recognize it. Give him the credit for the healing. Don't ever say, Dr. So-and-so healed me from that. No, he didn't. He might have given you some medicine. He didn't heal you. That medicine didn't heal you. God healed you. Amen. Amen. You're preaching good, brother. <laughs> He's the healer. He's the healer. Amen.